the core of the Gene Keys is about creating a space of contemplation, a space inside yourself so that you can feel the feeling. And I didn't know what, you know, I, I, I didn't know whether I was going mad. I didn't know, I didn't, I had no idea. I just, I, I had to just dis let my ego dissolve and crumble. And that's how it also reawakens. You know, we, are, we reawaken through going deep into our suffering. Is it like sin-based anarchy? Um. <laughs> yeah. That's, Which sounds well, kind of fun, by the way. And the Venus sequence describes, it's like a wound map. You know, so it's like, it is the it is the map of the suffering that you've inherited. Hello, Richard Rudd. What a pleasure to have you on my podcast. Everyone, Richard is an amazing human being who has brought to the world the Gene Keys. And I had the distinct honor of meeting him recently with our mutual friend, Blue of Earth. And we did a podcast together and our conversation was so deep and so broad, I immediately thought we have got to do another podcast, possibly two more or three more podcasts on all of the synchronicities in our work and how it all weaves together. We didn't even know each other until recently and now we're finding all these connections. And so I'm so excited to have you here with us, the modern day Merlin himself, Richard Rudd. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Yeah, I love Thank to, you. Love love being here. I, I loved our conversations. I, I'm excited to like keep learning from you and keep following the strand of how how our worlds are woven together. It's incredible, isn't it? I just am blown away by how many things I mean, we you know, we're doing our own thing. And I think this is happening probably around the world right now with so many people. They're mm -hmm. all doing their own thing. They don't necessarily see how it connects into a larger tapestry. Yeah. And we're all just like part of this gigantic tapestry. Yeah. And it's so Practical exciting. Jigsaw puzzle. So, so tell us a little bit how you got into this. Yeah, well, um, I guess, I mean, it, it's always been inside me, um, these, th this sort of, the perennial wisdom, I guess. And, um, but it, it, it kind of, you know, the, uh, the big shift that I, the story I tell most frequently, and it always gets better, by the way, every time I tell it, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is, you know, in 1990, the best stories do, by the way, exactly. And, and back in 1996, um, I woke up in my bed and, and I woke up into an, 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 a kind of, I guess, an awakened state of consciousness that lasted for three days and three nights. And in that experience, I, 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 I had a massive understanding or remembering of the cosmos and myself and us and all of it. And, the, and I was inside that, all these geometries and mathematics and, um, all the things you talk about, and I'm not trained in those left brain sciences, although I I'm familiar with them. And but I'm you know, but so I, where, where I'm interested is is how the right brain and the left brain bring together come together. So my you know, as a poet, as a storyteller, as a writer, um, and as you know, as someone who's fascinated in the scientific you know implications of all these things, I. I've explored, you know, since that since that experience I had that that kind of um, took me a long time to 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 understand. Um, I've been unpacking it, you know, ever since, you know. So even here, like many many decades decades later, I'm still unpacking that experience, and I've I've had further ripples of of it through time, where more wisdom has has come to me. Um, and, a, and a mission, I guess. And, and out of that came the Jinkies book that I wrote in 2009. Um, it's a big book and, you know, a big whole set of wisdom teachings based on the I Ching and DNA and all of that. And, um, and then it's just continued to grow and it's created a, a global community. And, um, you know, it has a big prophecy woven through it as well about these times that we're in. So it's, um, yeah. <laughs> Now, did you know, I mean, did you, when you first embarked on this and you wrote the book, I mean, it's kind of like probably how J.K. Rowling felt, you know. Um, I wonder how she felt and I wonder how you felt when all of a sudden something that you kind of just had this research on your own and you brought it to light has now become like a worldwide phenomenon. How, how did that feel 
to see it manifest in that way. Yeah, it was a fun, you know, it's like the moment I put the final stop, full stop of that book, you know, and it went through a lot of iterations, you know, to get it right. It's, it took me around seven years. But the moment I put that final foot stop, full stop and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> it's as good as it's going to get. Uh, I just had this feeling of, of this book has got its own destiny. It, it was a book that was written through me. And, uh, and I really wondered where it was going to go. And, and I haven't, you know, I, I've almost teased it in a way because I, I haven't like over marketed it. And I, I'm, I haven't poured lots of money, not that I have lots of money towards it. And it's just organically grown from no one hearing about it to being more and more um, used. And then I, I've expanded it into practical programs and all kinds of things so that you know, it's a synthesis and Gene Keys is, is a synthesis. In fact, you know, it, it is it is it is the synthesis, not that there are because there can't be more than one synthesis. I mean, there are millions of synthesis, but it's like it is a synthesis. It's, it's the synthesis of of all the wisdom traditions. And so it can go on being synthesized in it. And it because it's got fundamental patterns at the core of it, that's what I mean by it's a synthesis or it's the synthesis. Synthesis. It's like the mathematics that we've been talking about. Everything fits inside it somewhere because it's the fundamental pattern of, you know, and so it has all these geometries and wordings um, that can be used and utilized in lots of powerful, um, empowering ways to help. I mean, ultimately, my interest was to make it practical for people. So I've woven a kind of mystery school out of the gene keys um and it's become you know it's not a, it's it's not a it's not really about me it's it, it's it, there's a whole group of us uh, a, a community who have grown around it and within it and so we're a kind of um, what i call a synarchy in a way so you call it a what sorry a synarchy synarchy a lovely word synarchy um, like syntropy, syn like that that kind yeah, of S Y N. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I have these three fundamental principles at the core of the jinkies. Uh, one yeah. is. Synarchy. I mean, I was wondering for a moment. I was like, is it like sin based anarchy? Um, <laughs> yeah, S which sounds well, kind of fun, by the way. It sounds fun. It sounds fun. <laughs> well, it's like it's a word. It's a. Um, I learned the word. It's been around. It's been a sort of hidden word. I learned it from this teacher called um, Peter Dunoff, a Bulgarian master, amazing uh -huh. man from you know from the last century, and he used this word. And his main disciple Ivanov, you know, who carried that same teaching to France and into the West, and it, and he synthesized a lot of Kabbalah and a lot of Christ teachings and mm -hmm. pure men, and. Um, he used that word synarchy and um, in a very pure way that it, it's this, it's the self organizing principle of consciousness, you know, that's woven into all kind of, well, it, it's, it's everywhere. So if you think of bees or ants, they operate as a synarchy, you know, and mm -hmm. they're operating as one consciousness. And mm -hmm. so humanity also has a synarchy, but, but it's like, a good way of describing it is you, you get a white sheet of paper and you remember this from the school days, you put the iron filings on top and, a, and this random and then you random shape all over and then you put the magnet underneath and suddenly all those iron filings form these beautiful geometric patterns. That's synarchy. Um, it's that it's that wow. principle that brings coherence to the collective. Um, and it's I love that organizing. It's like a, it's like a pattern that you're not consciously aware of, that then you become consciously aware of, which yeah. is kind of like gene keys. When I when I first got, I was given a gift um, of of that book. I was given that book in 2018 by a dear friend, yeah. and um, and I looked at it and I immediately felt like, wow. Uh, because I'd already done a lot of connections geometrically with my friend Nassim Haramein, a uh, physicist, on the I Ching and the 64-point star tetrahedron, right? Which is another form of Metatron's cube, right? So just another way of looking at it. And, um, and, and then, of course, the 64 codons. And so I'd already, we'd already done a lot of work, and, and, and he had published a lot on that subject already as well. But then to see it in this form, I immediately felt like, First of all, there's no way that this could have been the work of a man. 
it it felt to me immediately like a transmission and and i recognize that because i've i've been a conduit for many of those similar kinds of transmissions and and mathematics and publications that i have you know been involved in publishing and books i've written as well so it's like i recognize a download when i see a download and this was so intricate and so sublime at the same time it was it was at the zenith of both simplicity and complexity simultaneously. And I thought, wow. And I knew there was something special about it. And of course, not knowing you or anything about your story, I'm not surprised at all to hear, you know, that you your first experience was to have this download that lasted for three days, because that's what it was like for me too. My first experience and download lasted three days. Yeah. And then I kept having it every six weeks. Uh, three to six weeks, uh, you know, sort of intermittent experiences where I'd have three days of downloads. And then that sort of turned in for me into now it's every day. But it was, you know, it was debilitating because I couldn't do anything for like a weekend and a Monday or something. I was completely useless. We were going to go somewhere, have fun or whatever. And it was like all the plans would just be shot because I would just be sitting in front of my notebook, just scribing it all down. And luckily, I had a significant other who was patient with me, right, that uh, that <laughs> wasn't thinking that I was absolutely losing my mind, which one can do, I'm sure. But, um, I mean, was that a kind of similar experience for you as well? Possibly, yeah, some, somehow. I mean, the, for me, the first one, which I mentioned in 96, was, the, was raw. It was just really raw. It was a raw transmission. It didn't stop. It was day and night. I didn't sleep. I couldn't, you know, I, my whole body was just on fire, you know, with this wow. Kundalini, you know, force that was just pouring through me with light, intelligence of light. And I, and, and, um, and I didn't know what, you know, I, I, I didn't know whether I was going mad. I didn't know. I didn't, I had no, idea. I just, I, I had to just dis- let my ego dissolve and crumble and, and so when I came down from those three days, you know, and I and, and it was a lovely story, but like maybe we can go into it at some point. But basically, I was I made my way to Bardsey Island in the north uh, north of west of Wales, which is the little beautiful little wild island where where supposedly Merlin finished his life, and and I and I was sitting on this little hill. And then and it was the third day at the end of the third day and and this and the and the the um, the field just kind of fell off me gently, you know, really, really gently as I was sitting on that little hill in this crystal little island in the middle of the ocean. And it felt like sitting on my own pineal gland. And it just went back down into the earth. And I was left um, back as me, Richard. And, um, And then I had like, I actually had like good seven years after that, just trying to come to terms with what had happened. Um, and and but then what what I realized was that the because it was like the doors had fully opened the door to mm-hmm. cosmic consciousness opened, and then they and then out of the compassion of the divine was like we can't just leave him there because and I was like please leave me here, <laughs> and and the but the doors closed almost and they just stayed a little bit ajar and that's where they've stayed ever since. Although there was a burst, there'd been a burst like you had it. So in two thousand four, I had another one where they opened. Um, and, and, you know, again, for three days and three nights, and then they closed again and just stayed a little bit ajar. And so those big explosions are, you know, that I, I couldn't lit, I couldn't, like you said, I couldn't live in a normal way it, with that ex, expanded state and, and my body and my chemistry had to wow. adjust to it. And it took years that first time. You know, and then it, and then I've become more and more adjusted and acclimatized to those frequencies, wow. um, and the and so the second one also blew me open emotionally at an emotional level, and um, and I, a whole transmission called the Venus sequence came through, and these other sequences that appear in the Gene Keys, which is about um, the nature of suffering and how suffering actually works in its core purpose. And it's the algorithms of suffering. That was what I should, and that that was an intense thing to see. Like, a, and out of that came this sequence that's universal, but also individual to every single one of us. So when you get your Venus sequence, which anyone watching this, you can go to genekeys.com 
get your profile, free profile, and in there you'll see these sequences. And the Venus sequence describes, it's like a wound map, you know? So it's like, it is the, it is the map of the suffering that you've inherited as a spiral through your DNA from your past, if, from the fractal line that connects you right back to the source of humanity. And so it, it shows you in a way, this is your slice of suffering that, or karma that you're here to transmute in this lifetime. And inside that suffering is all this grace, you know, is a, an immense amount of grace. So if you learn how to do alchemy on that suffering, you will, you will kind of, you'll transform it and you'll open up the higher centers and you'll see the purpose, your higher purpose in life. And so that sort of, that was my second big download. Um, well, and, I just uh, got yeah. chills on my whole body yeah. with you saying that. I feel like we need to dig deeper into this topic. Yeah. Um, so, so in essence, the suffering, what you're experiencing through this, like, you know, cycle of samsara where you're living and probably having the same patterns, right? yeah. the same patterns, the same the experiences over patterns. and over again. Yeah, it's through becoming consciously aware of those patterns and and understanding the suffering that becomes necessary for us to learn the reason for what we're suffering and how that can be transmuted from lead into gold through an yeah. alchemical process that yeah. the suffering is the key for us to learn our divine gifts and our, our city, right? And to, and to ultimately figure out what we're here to experience and learn. And I, I say this very similarly through saying, I believe that we're here and we learn through the opposites of the concepts that we wanted to learn. And so, you know, if you're here, for example, to learn unconditional love, you're going to suffer with conditional love over and over and over again. Absolutely. Until you no longer negatively judge it. Yeah. And then you've actually embodied the learning of true unconditional love. Exactly. And that's why... Is, you know, is that when, consistent with what you think as well? Exactly. So that's why when, you know, when you look in that Gene Keys book and you start to... It's a code book. It's a code book of human consciousness. And so you see the shadow, 64 of them, right? So you see these 64 shadows. And then each one of those shadows, as a word, you know, like say, take uh, conflict, six gene key, you know, that shadow of conflict is universal to all human beings, right? So it's, you see it in gene pools, you see it in the individual, you see it in relationships, you see it in businesses, you see it, you know, across tribal and collective, you see it everywhere, conflict. And it's, so it's a quintessential human shadow. But then what is the purpose of that shadow? You know, it has a gift inside it. And that gift is diplomacy. So how do we transform conflict into diplomacy through learning to listen, through learning the skills of empathy, through learning to take responsibility for our own views and emotions, all those those kind of emotional intelligence things we have to learn and and get and to get beyond our heads and to get into our bodies and to deal with our trauma, all of that is a part of the gift of diplomacy and also knowing timing, how to say things, when to say things, when to listen, when not to listen, you know, so wow. which boundaries you need in relationship, how all of those things are part of diplomacy. And then, so when you master the gift of diplomacy through mastering conflict, you then reach that city, which the city is the final flowering of the reason for conflict. And, the, and in that case, through that gene key, it goes, from it goes from conflict to diplomacy to peace and i put that in an upward downward but it's not really it's a, it's more radial so peace the state of peace the thing that we're all looking for is hidden in conflict so, <laughs> so beautiful it's like that and and there are 64 of these stories um and in the book and so i describe them in depth and the transition between them the transformational process and then so that's the code book of consciousness, the gene keys, but then the sequences, which I've made into lots of programs, the sequences show you your individual keys and the sequence that they're in. Because everything about, as you know, from, from life, everything in evolutionary terms is about sequences. DNA is built in sequences. We awaken in sequences. And so we have to kind of 
follow these steps and sequences and understand each key and then release it and transform it. And then immediately nested inside it is another one deeper, a deeper layer of suffering. So it's a bit like cracking a, a safe, you know, you, you're turning endless the suffering <laughs> means endless enlightenment. <laughs> exactly. It's layers. You know, it's like, but that, you know, people like St. John of the cross or these great mystics who went deep into the darkness and the, you know, any shaman that's gone deep into the underworld and fought the demons there are layers and layers of demons that you have to. It's meet. like it never ends, right? It's it's yeah. literally wow, but it, it shouldn't it end because also to our childhood, you know. So there's when you l really look at the Venus sequence, it's beautiful. It's mathematically beautiful because it's yes, it's built out of threes and sevens, seven year cycles of imprinting, and then they're, they're built in these threes and it and so so the first. This was like a little bit based on some of Rudolf Steiner's work. Um, that mm -hmm. the first seven years is a physical imprinting cycle. The second seven years, puberty, is you know so from eight to fourteen is an emotional imprinting cycle, and the third is a mental, the teenage years. And so that's our incarnation from naught to twenty-one is like these three cycles, which are really one cycle or iterations of one cycle. Are, are are encoded inside each other in a fractal way. So you can see your keys that relate to each of those cycles in the Venus sequence. You know, you can see specific, like a little acupuncture point, like it, like of all the possibilities, you've got like 29 gene key line four, you know, and you can see, wow, what that, what does that mean? And then the gene key helps you understand what's the story of that particular piece of suffering and how do I transform it? And then you keep going down another layer through that meridian point, and then it opens up to that deeper level of like, well, how did that get imprinted in me? And then even those three cycles are in, are, are kind of then they're they're logarithmically connected to the three trimesters, so they they're then kind of enfolded in the three the nine months, you know, or the three trimesters because it may not be nine months. And so you, you see the first cycle relates to the first trimester and the second and third. So you've got everything condensed in a fractal pattern into this, into this one moment of conception. So everything actually comes out of this split second moment of conception when the seed ruptures the egg. In that moment, that big bang, the fractal wounding pattern of the whole of consciousness is downloaded instantly but in a unique form. And then, the, and, then the, and then the sequences of the gene keys unpack them. So you can go, wow, that tiny moment, and you don't need to know the birth, you need to know the birth time, right? So you don't need to know the conception time, because if you've got the birth time, you've kind that, of got- That already says pattern. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's really, um, and place as well, because you need to know in the space time continuum. So you need to know in, your, in, in, in the gene keys, you need to know the same things you need to know for numerology. Yeah. Well, to do a numerological reading. Although you could add the name, but that's no, I've not gone there. <laughs> I, okay. But I know you have. Yes, absolutely, and I think it's 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 probably connected. So this is it. This is interesting. Have you ever looked at the connections between this? I just had a thought of a Carl Jung's work. Of course. On 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 types of personalities which is also related to 64. There are 16 personality types. Right. Right. And the 16 personality types, of course, that becomes a quaternity. And then it can reflect in 64 if you cut it down into smaller types. I've done a lot of work on Myers-Briggs uh, type. Yeah. And I probably performed more than 50,000 Myers-Briggs tests uh, on, on people. And I got to the point where I could even tell someone's Myers-Briggs test simply by asking two questions and they would not even know what the questions were that I asked. Yeah. Because I've, I've gotten to that level of being able yeah. to add it in subtly because I used yeah. it as a mechanism on how to hire people. Yeah, totally. And to understand them. And I can see immediate connections between your work and, and this. I see your work as being like a fifth dimensional form and there are many other dimensions to it as well that that builds on top of what we think of as, as astrology, what we think of as numerology, what we think of as psychology, 
all of them are connected into gene keys. Yeah. And, it, and even things like indigenous wisdom are also woven in there, as is sociology, because it also shows how gene pools connect. And I haven't really fully explored that yet myself. Um, but in the gene keys, there are these things called the codon rings. I named them mm-hmm. the codon rings. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're clusters of keys that go together in mysterious mm-hmm. ways. And they relate, there's 22 of them. And they relate to the 22 you know, sacred alphabet and they relate to the, the amino acids, you know, so it's, it's kind of, it's really interesting when you look inside the map of the gene keys and you see written in there, this it's deeply embedded in our biology, that that's the nature of our biology. These 21, 22 amino acids, it's it's even down to like, there's 21, but there's 22. (laughs) It's like, and and, well, it's like, it's like chromosomes as well. You know, Um, there's, there's 23, but actually there's 24 because one of them is fused. Exactly. And, and I have a feeling that that is going to be the case also with amino acids, that we're, we're going to see that number expand yeah. as our consciousness exactly. increases and go to 12 strand. I think we go to 24 amino acids, but well, I just exactly. kind of I got that I, I'd impression. I'd like to know more about that. And Zach Bush mentioned that to me recently. Oh, he did. I didn't know yeah. that you even yeah. talked. To, I just got it just now that there's going to be 24 amino acids, that, that this is, well, this is going to be one of the shifts. Well, apparently there, there are, there are patterns in the nature of the DNA, wh- which are kind of almost like holding patterns where the amino acids haven't arrived yet. Mm-hmm. This, this brings us back to our, our old friend. Um, uh, what's his name? Walter Russell. Yes, I was right. just going to say that. <laughs> I, I love that book. I, love I have it. this book, um, and I'm giving it. Uh, someone gave it to me to sign for him, and I'm, I, I just signed it, and I'm giving it back to him uh, tomorrow. But uh, so I had it on my desk, and I, I immediately thought of you. I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right. I remember Richard likes Walter Russell." Yeah, yeah, because he, what he he kind of did that, didn't it? He intuited the next, the, the true periodic table. Yes. You know, and, and, and he had, he had more elements than, you know, than the current one. And, and so it's in a way the same in our DNA is like, it has elements that haven't yet been discovered. It's like isotopes that are not yet expressed. Yeah. Not yet expressed. Exactly. So that is so fascinating. So, okay. So then how does this tie into, we talked about this subject during our podcast with blue on this golden thread. And it seems to me that, you know, your whole process of shadow gift city is leading towards a higher order um, knowledge of, you know, this higher order consciousness, which can be signified by this terminology of golden thread. And I'd love for you to expand on that, if you would, please. Well, in Gene Keys, uh, you know, the the name of the three sequences that you, again, when someone gets their profile online, you look at your hologenetic profile, I call it Gene Keys profile you'll see three sequences. There are more actually, but those are the three that are presented currently. And, um, and I call them the golden path. What links them is the golden path. And that golden path is an awakening journey. So the first one is called the activation sequence because it represents your purpose, your true purpose, your higher purpose in life. Your, not just your kind of what you're here to do, but your true purpose, your, your, the purpose of your soul. And then that, that kind of leads to the Venus sequence, which I mentioned, which is the emotional, you know, what, how does, what, what is, how does your heart, uh, how is your heart designed to awaken? And there's a whole storyline to that as well. And then the third one is called the pearl sequence, which is about, which is a smaller sequence, but it's about prosperity. It's how we're designed to prosper. So once we've found our purpose, and then we unlock our heart through our relationships, through healing our relationship, our heart through mm-hmm. relationships. It's kind of from then, that conflict to diplomacy. Is it somewhere in that diplomacy don't. stage before it goes on to the next? Exactly. And then as the heart starts to open, then prosperity is the natural culmination because prosperity then opens up the fractal, work, the you know, the, the field of synchronicity when the heart's open. See, the, the t- I mean, I can make it sound complicated, but there are people, there are great poets who've made it so simple. They just said, open your heart and everything will work. <laughs> it's like, and it's so true. 
Open your heart through that sequence and the next sequence behind it, inside it, is called this pearl. And it's how we're designed to prosper collectively. So when your heart opens, you've, you meet your, your true allies. They start to come in because you've, your heart starts to emanate that frequency that brings them towards you, like the bees, you know, the synapses. Yeah, yeah, it's form. magnetic. Mm -hmm. and, then you're, and then different purposes come together to form a higher collective purpose, and that's the pearl. So there's a whole story in that. I wanted to just frame that. That's what in mm -hmm. Jesus we call the golden path. And that because it's a step se series of sequences. And if, if you do those programs that many people are, have done those programs and we run them as online retreats and we do them in all kinds of ways all over the world, um, then if you do them, you will experience all those steps and stages of that awakening process through your relationships mm -hmm. into prospering, you know, so your, your, your prosperity situation changes as well. Everything's interconnected. Um, so there's that, but then the golden thread that we're talking about is, is, is very much connected to that. But I was, we talked about it in terms of our incarnations, you know, mm -hmm. and how that's one life I've just described, the golden path, mm -hmm. the journey from, you know, mm -hmm. the healing of our wound of birth up to our death. That's one breath. Mm -hmm. Our life is a breath, you know. And so, oh, so the absolutely. Life, I mean... Yeah. You know, the number of breaths we have in a day is the same number of years that there are in the great year. Yeah. How many do they, how many do they say? It's, it's, we, well, the average person, right, would have uh, approximately 3.333 seconds for each breath, inhalation, exhalation cycle. Yeah. And that happens 25,920 times per day. Yeah. Which is the length of the earth's great year. Yeah. in years Perfect. so it's the equal procession of equinox yeah it's just a long exactly. breathing cycle it's beautiful but and what i was saying is that the the in breath the first breath that we take as a as we're born and the last breath that we take as we die the inhalation and the exhalation they're also one breath right so but also the the exhale of our death is paired with the inhale of our next birth, right? Yes. So it never ends. It can't end, right? So, but what's the thread that connects those two storylines, let's call them lives, fractals, you know, because everything is, you know, this is the golden thread. The golden thread links, or the, or the thread of consciousness links us forwards in time, backwards in time to a grand story of humanity. But then it's not just us. You know, there are multiple souls woven across us as well. So we're all part of that. If you take all those little threads and they're all woven across each other, it's almost like you've got a piece of rope, you know. But if you then pan out, that can actually be a tiny thread as well. Yeah. And then you see that that thread is actually being woven and stitched through, you know, the fabric of reality to create a tapestry. And all of us together, all of our lives, all of our we're creating this incredible mandala, you know, that, that began at the big, this big bang and will end at the end of this universe that we're in. But then even that will just be an in breath and an out breath of, of a greater, you know, tapestry. So it, it's, it's a fractal, you know, we, we've heard this story, the never ending story, but what, what are, the golden thread where it's magical is, and, and I kind of connect it also with like, in mythology, the golden bough and those those beautiful, you know, discoveries that uh, Frazier made in that book, and and people like Joseph Campbell, you know. Oh yeah, found, I'm a huge fan of Joseph Campbell. Yeah, me too. So they found these threads in mythology and these threads in the creation stories. Hero's the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these threads are like we call them the golden thread because they link all the other threads together. And like I was sharing in our our podcast recently, the. The, the gold thread is the avatar consciousness. So it's like wherever, like you can have all these other threads of lives and lifetimes and incarnations and they're playing this grand scheme. And there's this one tiny thin gold thread that crosses over all of them. But every time it crosses one, it it turns the, all the touch others it. That it, into gold. It's got the Midas touch. <laughs> exactly, it's the Midas touch. And so that's in a way we have these experiences 
in our life where a threat, you know, when that thread, if it crosses us, like when I had my experience in 1996, the thread crossed my, you know, I was moving through time and space as we all are. And then suddenly in my trajectory, this avatar thread crossed me exactly where I was, exactly that time. It crossed my fractal line and it carried on. But the, but it changed me forever. <laughs> And it, and it changed my life forever. And then, but that, and then everyone who is connected to me, that gold thread passes into them in some way, and it and it and it passes from them into them. And so the golden thread never it's it's a fra it's never ends. It's an awakening process. And and so I love that. And one other thing that came to me one day was that mm -hmm. if the golden thread happens to cross your fractal line. At the moment of conception, <laughs> can you imagine that? that? That doesn't happen very often, right? It's it's a coincidence. Then a great Buddha is born, you know, because it, it you know, so so some 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 being of epic, because it's right through the core of the fractal and that exact conception point, and so you that's where you get these kind of this this the incarnated avatar consciousness, and in order for that to happen. The, the the timing has to be you know very split <laughs> split second <laughs> <laughs> and and anyway so that's part of the story as well the tapestry of human evolution is is littered with these um, golden threads that come in and out of form and we you and I love tracking them it's all, it's what we do we oh, track yeah. them in lots of different ways through lots of different pantheons through different sciences. It is. It's through things. lots of different pantheons as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, I was just studying this last weekend. I was studying the Slavic pantheon, oh, which again wow. has the same stories in it yeah. of Osiris, of Hermes, of it, it, it's all the same. It's, it's, it's astounding. And I, I didn't know this until this weekend, but I started looking it up and, you know, there's been this Nordic connection obviously from the nordic pantheon odin and wotan and 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 these different characters in the nordic pantheon which has then led to you know the days of our week for example you know like yes. wednesday was wotan's day for example yeah. thor's day was thor thor's day which was god of of thunder which is also yeah. representative of jupiter and that's why we say judy in french which is yeah. jupiter's day right and and we just have this germanic nordic kind of Latin language that is basically interlaced all of it. But strangely, it also comes true in, in China and in Korea and Japan. They have the same meanings for the days of the week, even though these have been around for a long time. Yeah. And the Slavs, um, you know, during communism era, they went to like days of the week or just one, two, three, four, five, six, right? That was sort of a communism thing because they didn't want to tie it together to the Pantheon. No. But they have, you know, their, their version of Thoth is this uh, is this god named uh, Velev, and and it has the exact same characteristics. He's a trickster as yeah. well. You know, yeah. he's like this god of the Matrix. He's the messenger like, god, like uh, like Loki from the but, yeah, like Loki exactly. And and that's exactly from the Nordic tradition. And so I started to look up the the DNA trace lines um, to see where the Nordics actually came from, and. Lo and behold, guess what? They came from the Slavs. Yeah. So their original sort of genealogy goes right back to those same Slavic yeah. people that were right next to Greece yeah. as well like the, in like sort of the, the, the Ukraine the area. Yeah. Say again? The Bogomils. You know, yes. Those, those people exactly. were very mystic people. Yes, they were very mystical people and, and every different pantheon. You could go to Mesoamerica yeah. And find the same stories of, you know, yeah. Tehuti Huacan is, is Tehuti and, and, and the feathered sacrifice. serpent. You, there's often, a, you know, like we were talking about the wounding, there's often a mm -hmm. sacrifice component. So like in the Nordic pantheon, the god of light, Baldur, mm -hmm. you know, he was shot by Loki through the ankle with an arrow of mistletoe, you know. Yeah. And, it, and you, I mean, we've heard that story before as well, right? It's Absolutely. Like, and so it's the only place where that he can be Cupid. shot. Right. Cupid's the arrow. Ankle. Yeah, the ankle. It's like it's the straight Hermes. from Achilles story and yeah. the Battle of Troy. Yeah, it's um, like the winged heels, you know, as well. Like absolutely, of Mercury. His, his nature of as a deity can 
you know, is taken from him in that sense. And he's sac- he becomes a sacrificial being because, you know, he has to come down into the form as we did, as we do. The avatar has to come down into the form and it has to give up its it's deity, you know, it's, 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 well, think about it. It's the only thing that would make sense. If you're in a matrix game, I I create, I'm creating right now a game called Maya. Yeah. One of my companies is, is creating a simulation game. It's a spiritual life simulation game called Maya. It's fascinating. And it uses, um, even like glasses for augmented reality and everything. And so you, you go around, you're playing this game all the time. It's kind of like the life we're living. It's strange. But <laughs> like you like- can look down and see your chakras and see them activated with geometries and everything. You yeah. can do digital sculptures and you can leave clues for people. And it, in higher dimension, they're like in digital dimension. And then if someone's wearing the glasses, they would see it immediately, right? As if it's real and solid and everything right there. It's very cool. It's very cool. And it's like this big scavenger hunt or treasure hunt to find you. And, and as soon as I started making this game, I started thinking, okay, so what do we do? Are we going to give ourselves special powers? And I started thinking, well, if I were an omnipotent, omniscient, divine being, the only game that would ever make sense would be to limit my powers in that world. Of course. It would Always never make fun. sense to have all my powers. The point is, like, you have to limit yourself. It's like giving yourself the handicap, right? In, and you in hide them, right? You hide your own powers in all kinds of magical, mystical places. And then you find it. It's like you're yeah. playing hide and seek with yourself. Yeah. And, and that's what it feels like we're doing. We're all doing this. We're, we, we're, we, like, dumb ourselves down <laughs> to be in this experience so that we can find ourselves again because the one divides itself into the many, simply for the joy of becoming one again. Exactly. But the, and the beauty is it's mathematically perfectly constructed, right? Because it is like a simulation. It is a simulation. And simulate, you know, like, like your computer game, it's all made up of pixels. <laughs> yeah. And the, and and the algorithms. basic form is all right triangles. Even in simulation games, the basic form is all right triangles. Everything is the right triangle. And the right triangle and I published a paper on this, is, is really about the infinite sum, the infinite product, and the infinite difference. And, and this is like omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. Yeah. And, and everything can be made from that one form. Like literally, it can fill any void space in two, three, four, five, any level of dimensions. It doesn't matter. It's so simplistic. It's divine. It's sublime. But so coming back for a moment, okay, so... Where does Hermes fit in all of this? And why does he show up everywhere yeah, it's, in it's all great. these different pantheons? It's, it's like this, that is definitely a golden thread through all of it. And he is kind of a trickster too, right? Yeah, he's got, totally. he's funny. It's, it's, the, it's the joker. He's a total joker and a trickster. But in, and, and the way, one of the way I understand how, you know, Hermes appears is, um, you know he he understands because you know, in the num in the numbering pantheon of the cosmos mm-hmm. we have these things called master numbers right mm-hmm. and and they're wormholes so like in in the gene keys for example which is a kind of is a yeah you know, as i said it's a synthesis but it goes from it's 64 it's made of a 64 right so in the gene keys pantheon because it's a pantheon yeah are 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 then the the master numbers would be 11 33 44 and 55 right so those yeah and and there are many more out through littered throughout the cosmos there there's there are these repeated double digit numbers or they can be triple triple digit but they're where the golden thread likes to kind of go through the hole you know so wherever you see a master number is a wormhole where you're going to find a golden thread so double digit numbers or treble digit numbers master numbers are places they're kind of backdoors in the matrix. So when you look down at your clock and you and it's eleven eleven, at that specific moment, it gives you that kind of ah, oh, I'm in I'm in the matrix. I, that that's just reminded me that I'm in this matrix. Yeah, yeah, totally. The synchronicity, awareness. yeah, the media, pure synchronicity. Mm-hmm. So the so in a way, the way to look at the way I understand through the gene keys. The story woven. There's a beautiful story woven by those those master numbers. The number eleven is kind of the master master number, <laughs> because. And I'd love to hear what you have to say about the number eleven. Actually. Oh yeah, so, so much. It's a portal, okay. right? It's a it portal. is a portal. And, 
Yeah. It also though, has a lot to do with the Great Pyramid. Yeah. Because the pyramid the, is seven over 11, height yeah. to its base. I love those sevens and those 11s. So in, in, um, in southern England is a, is a hill figure, a chalk figure called the Long Man of Wilmington. And it's yep, I know it story. well. Mm -hmm. you know it. Mm -hmm. and, and he stands in, in, in these two doors, and he's standing in a doorway holding them yes. with his hands, right? Mm -hmm. And people have said, well, what are, these, what, is, what, is the, what are these lines that he's holding? And it's actually the number 11, <laughs> you know, because he's standing in the, he's a portal. It's a portal. Yeah. That's a portal. That place is a portal. He's a portal. You know, every time you see an 11, it's a portal. You know, it's funny um, you say that because even in Chinese, the word for portal or doorway is made with, with you know, Chinese characters that look like an 11. Ah. Same thing. It's yeah. the exact same thing. It's, it's like moon, right? And they've got little, little windows up at the top and then come down like this to form this portal. Right. So, that, so, so that I, I think this is something that's a thread through everything. It's well, part of consciousness. Totally. And my understanding of the Hermes energy is that it's the, it's the divine, yes, it's the divine player, the holy fool, the, the, the trickster. And, and sent the fool the card from the tarot. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sent from the Godhead, the messenger that comes to deliver, you know, the, the story, the narrator. You know, he comes and he opens the doorways and he's a 3-3, three, three. you know, he's a 33. He's threes. He's all threes. Because he's the he's the he's neither yin nor yang. He's a hermaphrodite. You know, he's often presented that way. The trickster, the Hermes energy is is that third component of the of the you know the staff. It's the staff with the serpents, Ida Pingala, and the, you know, and it's Sushumna going up the center. It's the sword. It's the it's that three that transcendent capacity. So with you know so. That's why he or she can travel through the cosmos without, you know, because it, that energy is a master of duality because it's transcended duality because the third is the transcendence of duality. Yes. So in order to come down into the form. It's also reminding me of uh, Freemasonry, yeah. who are all hermeticists. Right. And, and the 33rd degree. Right. Exactly. Drop it in there. We can, which is their highest degree. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in order to come down into the form of duality, which is the, made up of the twos, <laughs> it's a binary, uh, that creature, that being has to drop one of its strands of DNA. So it's three strand DNA, which is a 33. It leaves mm -hmm. it, it has to leave it and sacrifice and come into the 22. And mm -hmm. the, in Vinci's, the twenty-two is the is is all the the codes for suffering, right? <laughs> and and the eleven is is what anchors it into the form. You know, so it's interesting. I keep I keep hearing music playing as you're speaking. That this is a <laughs> musical representation, and that even the sevens, right, and the three times the seven, twenty-one, and then to the twenty-second, and twenty-two over seven is pi. It's interesting to me because it's like the white keys on a piano keyboard that they were literally going through notes of expression, right? And it's just all the white keys that then break into further differentiation, right? There would be, you know, 24 quarter tones within each of those seven days right. of a week. That's why we have 24 hours in each day of the seven days in a week, the right? That, these are all right. musical tones of experience that we're just playing on some giant musical clock, right? That seems to be entirely predetermined. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. And then when you think about seven as well, I find it interesting that you got your first download in 1996, which is a digital root of seven. Yeah, I'm a seven. Because, guy. you know, one, nine, nine, six equals seven when you do the, the numerological digital root of that number. I don't think that's a coincidence. And then secondly, every cell in our bodies will die and you will become an entirely new person every seven years. Yeah. As I was saying about the seven, the three, seven year cycle. It's, it's like musical. So as you're speaking, I'm hearing music playing. It's, it's kind <laughs> it of bizarre you're because. You're absolutely right. It's, that's what the DNA is. The DNA is eight octaves, 64 you know, it's just, we are music. That's all we are, you know, and, and Hermes is, is a, 
is a is like this beautiful conductor that comes in and just drops in these these melodies that kind of set the tone more golden whole... threads yeah exactly wow <laughs> that's a mind so anyway, blower that's, that's how 33 goes through 22 and anchors itself into 11 <clears throat> and and that's how it also reawakens you know we are we reawaken through going deep into our suffering again you know, so we have to really understand the depths of our suffering because in there is the golden thread hidden. And if you think about it, like if you were going to hide from yourself the highest attribute of your, of your, you know, of your, 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 your city, your highest potential, your greatest divine gift, where would you hide it? In the darkest place. In the darkest, hardest the place. The most right? unlikely place. <laughs> But it's like in Star Wars where Luke Skywalker has to go into the cave, right? Yeah. After he's been training with, with Master Yoda, he's got to go in the cave and, and he has to battle himself. And then he breaks the mask of the person he's battling who he thinks is Darth Vader and it's his face. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's, it's the hardest thing. And inside that most difficult, painful experience is where the ego breaks and the heart expands. Yeah. That's it. Because the heart never breaks. It only expands. Yeah. But the ego breaks. Yeah. Along the journey. And it's such a powerful, powerful story for all of us because we tend to see all of the challenge in our lifetimes as being this thing we don't want to experience. But actually, that's the very reason we came here mm -hmm. is so we could experience it and expand through it. Yeah. I, when I... um. I, I taught this course. Um, it's, it's a it's a program in the Gene Keys. Gene Keys is like a mystery school, and it has multiple programs. and And they're they're not just programs; they're they're transmissions. And one of them is called the Seven Sacred Seals, and which we could go off and <laughs> explore. Oh, yeah. where, where <laughs> sure. they came from, and you know, mm -hmm. obviously from the Book of Revelation and all kinds of oh yeah. Associations. <clears throat> but the Seven Sacred Seals are the, are the in, in 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 the gene keys world are the codes that heal the core wounds of suffering they're the angelic frequencies that heal the core wounds inside humanity so there are seven core wounds and there are seven cities you know these these divine attributes one for each of the wounds and so you know, working through the seven seals is a way of, of magically incarnating higher frequencies, angelic frequencies, and they're encode and you and you can encode them or re-encode them into yourself through these very powerful invocations that you that are done in the like in the incantations. Program. Yeah, they're like incantations, but then affirmations, there are also mantras. Go, there are mudras that go with them, and there are mm -hmm. you know there's there's there are there are a whole kind of esoteric. Uh, magical white magic tradition in a way and anyway so through those seven seals are kind of contained these seeds of of the kind of the uh, ultimate healing of of our suffering not just as individuals but as a whole race you know the whole of humanity is con is contained in those seals and they're seals that are open from the higher side already they're like a valve to higher consciousness but we have to open them from the from our side, you know. So we have to. We actually have to. It's like grace, like because they they come out. They're the keys of grace. Yeah, yeah. And and grace is just you have to ask for. You know, you have to ask for help. You know, you have to kind of. You, oh, it's surrender. To, Ultimately, we have to surrender. Yeah, and and these three words came to me when I was downloading that program, and they're very. I've, I've been taken to task for them. <laughs> As 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 you would be, because they are suffering is grace, and it's a very intense equation. <laughs> um, and when I was in Russia, suffering you know, is grace. Suffering is grace. And, and, and Those are the three for, words. Yeah, easy for me to say. Easy for us sitting in our nice privileged positions here to say those words. But actually, the reality is when you are in the when someone is suffering really, you know, a terrible thing in the world, then. I don't say it lightly, you know, and, and that person who's who's being abused or whatever, it's they don't know it's grace in that moment. Right. And, and, and but 
there's a deeper reason for everything. That's what that's what those words really point to. There is a deeper, higher alchemical reason for everything. And we don't even necessarily see that in this lifetime, in this form. You know, it's, it, I, it's so funny so it's you say this. Thing. It's a very intense thing. And we did this beautiful thing in Russia. I was, I was in St. Petersburg and we did the seven seals for what we did just a day. And, um, and we took those three words and they were translated into Russian. And every single person is 150 people in a room. And every single person l went around the room and said those words looking in someone's eyes over and over again. We moved around the room looking in different people's eyes, hit, saying and hearing and receiving those three words. Suffering is grace. Suffering is grace. And we and I encourage people to really let it come up. And soon the room just kind of broke open um, because it, it, people tears started to come and it, it's a really visceral experience when you hear truth spoken and it's a hard truth and you realize wow my father my mother my grandparents really like all the suffering that all the genetic suffering that we carry through our through our ancestry and especially in that room in russia which oh, especially in russia I mean, yeah. I would think I'm, I'm trying to wonder what the translation in Russian would be. And I keep coming back um, to suffering is just suffering, right? In Russian. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a very Russian thing to say. That would be actually. such a Russian thing. Like, every translation comes back to suffering is just suffering. They have um, that humor. <laughs> they have that wonderful humor, the Russians. I, I, yes, I, they I, do. I but I mean, on. just read Tolstoy. Yeah. Or, you know, it's like we, you know. <laughs> Dostoevsky, I, I mean, geez, like that's depressing stuff, man. It, it's intense. They carry, uh, but you know, it's like you mentioned the Slavic, you know, earlier on that like um, Dunov and Ivanov, those great sages, they they predicted that the the reawakening of humanity would begin in the Slavic races. Steiner also predicted that it would be in the Slavic races because that's where the suffering of the world was most intense. I think so this is why were, we have this war. Place. Yeah. I think that's why we have this war in, in Ukraine. I think so, yeah. Which is another, you know, it's, a, it's I always think of Ukrainium, like the head. Yeah. It's like a, a brain concept, right? And also uh, pituitary and, and pineal gland activations. And I do think that there is, this fractal is playing out in the simulation all over the place. Yeah. And we're seeing symbologies of it everywhere. And there's no such thing. I've learned, you know, I used to think that there were such thing, there was a such thing called coincidence. Now I know much better. There's no such thing. And in a, a matrix of mind, which is exactly what Walter Russell would say as well, right, of the universal one mind, and we're all living out God's imaginings, um, you can conceive how that would be the case, that everything yeah. is a divine manifestation. And, you know, it's interesting, this 33... Um, is really impacting me right now. And it's reminding me of an experience that I had right before I went to the Great Pyramid on a journey in 2018. I went there in 2017. And I'm going to drag you. You know this. You're going to spend the night <laughs> in the pyramid with me. It's freaking happening, man. So don't even, don't even try to argue. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see what happens when you go there. And and I'll bring, we'll bring Matthias as well. It'll be epic. It'll Brilliant. be totally epic. I'm sure we'll have like some, you know, existential out of body experience. I'm quite sure <laughs> of that. But when I went there, I'll just tell you a story because it relates to this 33. And I had been in, uh, in Egypt in 2017. And then I felt the need to go back 222 days later. Exactly. And uh, 222 is a golden ratio number. It, it represents love and everything. That's why, you know, a, a lot of what people think about, um, you know, with 222 two, two, tends to be like a love frequency. And same with 555. Five, yeah. five. There's, there's grace. kind of like... In the I Ching, in, just so you know, in the I Ching, it's hexagram of grace. Grace. There you go. So, so basically, I went 222 days later, which happens to be if you take 222 and a half and you divide that into 360 degrees of a circle, it gives you 0.618. So it's a golden ratio right? Yeah. That's also why it's love. And, and so I went back and it was um, May 6th that I was in Israel for a week. And the entire time I'm drawing in my notebooks 
Alpha Omega, like literally drawing Alpha Omega pictures everywhere in my notebooks. And, and I knew going to Israel, because I was in Israel for a week before I went to Egypt, and I knew that I was going to discover something. In fact, the day before I left to go to Israel, I was in my uh, in-law's house, and I went out to go get a bag out of the car, and a giant white egret, which are not even really native to Southern California, I don't even know how it ended up there, um, basically flew in front of me and landed right in front of me like this big Bennu bird, which is this bird that represents the number 33 and resurrection. And I saw it standing right in front of me. And I was like, it was 10 feet in front of me. And it was probably, you know, eight foot wingspan or something like this. It's like an eye. And I went to grab my phone to take a photograph of it. And it turned around and flew away. And I was just yeah. standing there stunned. And I was holding like these bags. And I knew something was going to happen when I went to Israel. So I went to Israel I went to visit Peter, the apostle's home, which was 888, because his home in Capernaum was actually three octagons, right? And right in front of it was this large mosaic uh, on the ground, which was also an octagonal shape of a peacock, which was interesting. And, and then we stopped at a gas station. And while we were at the gas station, it was going to be 45 minutes to refuel the bus. And it was on the way to Jerusalem. And they said, look, uh, you could get out here, get some food or something, go to the gift shop, you know, do whatever while we're refueling the bus. And, and I was on a trip with like 45 CEOs of S Southern California, and I was the host of the trip. And so we got off the bus and the guy's like, oh, and by the way, if you want to get baptized, this is where Jesus got baptized. So we're all like, you want to get baptized? <laughs> <So> <laughs> And I was on a spiritual journey, so I was like, I'm going to do it. And then everyone was like, yeah. okay, let's do this. Right. So I was the first one. I get in the river. It's the exact spot where Jesus supposedly gets baptized, and I got baptized there. I didn't even know that I was just following this journey. I get to, uh, I get to Jerusalem, and the night before I'm going to Israel, I'm going to go to Egypt, I'm in King Zedekiah's cave, which is right underneath. It was a state dinner function we had these big candelabras, there was a harpist in there and everything. It was this cave that's on the Jordanian side of Jerusalem that is immediately under the Dome of the Rock, which is the Al-Aqsa, you know, the mosque is right there as well. And, and so I asked where the bathroom was in this place. There's the harpist there. And I was supposed to give this speech. So I jumped over the rope and I went deep into the cave, acting like I'm looking for the bathroom. It says, do not enter, do not enter. And I find in there this place, deep in the cave, probably about, you know, 500 meters or so into the depths of this cave. And I've, I'm using my iPhone with, the, with my light and my battery is not, I don't have much battery on my phone. So I'm like freaking out because I will not find my way back. And I have it all on film. And I'm, I'm looking for where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden, because this is where the Ark was supposed to have been hidden. And I find this mound of everything around me is limestone. It's a limestone cave, but there's a mound with steps right next to it that's all turned to quartz crystal. And I take my camera and I'm like, this is interesting. I film all of this and I look down and right where I'm standing is carved into the floor in Alpha Omega. And so I'm like, whoa, this is weird. I've been drawing Alpha Omega all week. So the next day I get on a plane, I go to Egypt. And I am in the king's chamber with 12 of my friends. One of them is laying in the sarcophagus. And I have this remembrance of being in the king's chamber when the pyramid was just finished. And pressing, being there when this rose granite sarcophagus rim is pressed with an alpha omega on the rim. Now, the Great Pyramid is famously devoid of any kind of hieroglyphics or anything on the inside. There's nothing in there to give us clues about who built it and when it was built or anything. And just as I remembered this, I looked down at the exact same spot on the rim of the sarcophagus, and it was an Alpha Omega in the exact same spot. And I could see it out of the corner of my eye, and the light was just right for me to be able to see it. And trust me, when you go in there, you'll see this, and you're going to go, how in the hell did you ever see this? It's hard to find. It's almost chimeric, but it's it's undeniable. Yeah. You can't unsee it once you've seen it. So I, I see um... this Alpha Omega, and no one's ever seen this before. 
And immediately I'm thinking, wait a minute, I just saw an Alpha Omega last night in Jerusalem. Now tonight, which was on 5-7, so this was on May 7th, night, uh, two, 2018, I'm seeing an Alpha Omega on the rim. And so I started to measure the distances of this Alpha Omega on the rim of the sarcophagus to find if there's any significant mathematical correlations that I can tie to this. Now, we've found, myself and Alan Green, who you know as well, um, have found all the mathematical constants that we know exist embedded within the, the basic proportions of the Great Pyramid. And the foot, meter, and cubit are also hidden in there as well. And we know that the god of weights and measures is also the same Thoth, the same Mercury. And, and so all of the units of measure, I mean, even the entry into the king's chamber is one meter high. Exactly. Why would they choose that exact number? It doesn't make sense in cubits, right? I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> you can also take a cubit, a royal Egyptian cubit would be if I took the radius of a circle with one meter as its radius, a 30 degree arc of that that would take one second for a pendulum to swing across each direction would be exactly 1.718 feet, which is one Royal Egyptian cubit, is the arc of a one meter radius, right? At 30 degrees of arc or pi over six. So it's, it's like fundamental somehow, right? These things are all connected and all three units of measure were used to build the Great Pyramid. We know this now. And, and so I looked at the measurements and the, the length of the sarcophagus is 89.62 inches. And the A at the apex is at the 33rd inch from the far, uh, what I would call the, the west or rather the southwest corner, right? Of the, if you're looking at the King's Chamber from the entryway, the back wall is the west wall. So the southwest side corner from that southwest side corner to the A apex is exactly 33 inches. And the omega is exactly at 30 inches. But when you look at it as a proportion of the entire length, the omega is at 0.33 of the 89.62 inches. So 30 inches divided by 89.62 comes out to be 0.33. So you've got 33 and 33 basically as mirror reflections of each other. And from those two, just from the proportions, which are 5.605 inches was the length of the Alpha Omega, which happens to be the square root exactly of pi times 10. And so 5.605 inches, right, times 0.5605 equals pi, right? It's perfect. And when you also recognize that the perimeter of the room itself is exactly pi times 10 meters, uh, I started realizing, wait a minute, this had to have been put at the building. It was put here when it was built. It was part of the design. And it's so perfect. And the representation of the 33rd inch and the point 33rd, right? It's like this merging of masculine and feminine and finding this balance between the two is creating this hermaphrodite of divinity, the merger of masculine and feminine. And I don't know if that rings any bells for you or anything, but I fundamentally believe that now we know that Metatron's cube is the foundational basis of the entire Giza plateau. It's all music. And if that's the case, then this relationship that you just mentioned of, of Hermes being 33, right. As a master number, um, mm -hmm. makes tons of sense. And I didn't really connect those dots until now. Yeah, well, I, I thank you for that story. It's a fantastic story. I love it. It's like a mystical whodunit. And I think, um, you know, wherever we see these master numbers, especially 33, we that's where we see the trace of Hermes. It's like Hermes was here. It's like his signature. Yeah. You know, and... And Alpha Omega oh, is that too, when you think about it, because yeah. Alpha is the bull, right? It's Aleph. Yeah. The word Alpha means bull. In yeah. Semitic, Aleph means bull. And it's the symbol of Taurus, the Taurus symbol, and then the Venus symbol. That's why I was fascinated when you were talking about the Venus aspect of Gene Keys, because the Venus symbol is the circle with the cross underneath it, right? Mm -hmm. And when you merge the Taurus and Venus, you have Mercury. Yeah. So it's literally Alpha Omega. This is the same 
the, the Venus symbol is the same as the Ankh. It's a similar symbology to the Ankh. It represents the Omega. So Alpha Omega together are Hermes. It yeah. is the Thoth symbol. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's the beginning and the end, right? Isn't it? We, when we started the, the first breath and the last breath. And, and, and in the middle is, is, the, is the game, is the theater, is the dance, isn't it? Between the opposites. That's the third component. Thing I, and you see this every time someone has made a breakthrough, you know, whether it was Carl Jung or whether it was, you know, whoever it was in any in any sphere, it's always because they've transcended the duality, you know, and then they've made the leap to the next level. Like Hegel, the you know, philosopher and his and his transcendent philosophy of understanding, you know, thesis, antithesis and synthesis. Yeah, and, I love that. And you're going to see, you just see this in wherever genius emerges, you see the 33. You know, you, you see this transcendent understanding that's dawned. And it's, and it's often woven, you know, it's a signature that you could, you'll see it, you'll find it in music, even in the triplet, you know, in music. That, that I've got a musician friend of mine who, um, who's a, a brilliant concert pianist. And she says the triplet is though very special in music because it kind of each triplet leaves you hanging and it connects to the next triplet. And, and it's like a, it's a, it's an, it's where you see the golden thread in music because it kind of, it's like, it has to link to the next one. I think, <laughs> is, are you referring to the, the tritone? Well, you, you could look at it like that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's the linkage between to, always between two du between a duality and another duality is the twin. It's know, it's like, this. It's it's yeah. exactly the triqueta. Yeah, and the yeah. and the Celts were you know that's a Celt the old Celtic symbol, isn't it? The, mm -hmm. the Druids um, were really hot on those threes. <laughs> so how do you transcend duality, Richard? How does one transcend duality? Because I think people are like, yeah. okay, we're suffering. Uh, yeah. You have to realize, I think one aspect of it, I'm sure you're, you're, you'll say this in some way, shape or form, has to be in how we look at the world, our perception. Well, I have three words that I, I, I use, of course, in Gene Keys. In Gene Keys, when, if, if, if anyone watching this is interested in Gene Keys and you come in and you start to explore the mystery school and the programs and the books and things, you will see that the number three is woven everywhere, but kind of secretly. So everything is laid out in threes. And um, for transcending duality, the three words that I use are allow, accept, embrace. And they kind of relate to these three levels of the shadow, the gift, and the city. City, by the way, if, if you don't know, is, is a Sanskrit word. I mean, mm -hmm. I know you know, but for the viewers or listeners, it's a Sanskrit word meaning divine, expression or, or superpower if you like mm -hmm. and and so you know allow is the word that goes with the shadow you know because when you feel a, a state of misery or a state of um collapse or contraction or fear or uh, anger or anything that causes you to contract in your essence then in order to kind of in order to, you have to first of all allow it. You know, that's a, you, the, allow is a very generous term because you allow the shadow to be. And what you're doing is you're just, you, you don't have to like it. You can hate it. You can be angry. You can, you can, you know, everything is, is encompassed in allowing. It's just allowing the feeling. So you have to create a little bit of space to do allowing. You know, I, I, the, the, gene, the core of the Gene Keys is about creating a space of contemplation, a space inside yourself so that you can feel the feeling it can even be numbness numbness i feel nothing and numbness is is also a, a kind of feeling at yeah. a deep level mm -hmm. but in, unless you want you've got to create that space of allowing that's the first step in order that you can actually feel the feeling fully without trying to escape it because what we do is we try and escape yeah you feeling. can't go into the escapism yeah. or denial of it. It's best yeah, just to feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what the mind does. The ego does. It tries to distract us endlessly away from mm -hmm. the feeling, the melancholy, the, the kind of 
per, the lack of purpose, the whatever it is, whatever each person's carrying. It, 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 it's like wounds. fear in a way. Uh, for me, it's yeah. like people that say, you know, they don't want to have any fear in them. I think that's not necessarily the right path. I think freedom to, from fear means that you can feel it and then just let it wash through you and it doesn't control you. Exactly. Because danger might be real, but fear becomes the choice. To hold yeah. on to that fear is holding on to it. And, but, but to deny its existence is, is equally bad. Well, exactly. You, you have to go that. ahead and absorb it and feel it. Otherwise, it will just come back and manifest in some other way. It's the first step in, in, in self-love. You know, is what you're talking about is is to just allow the feeling. Go right here. It is. I'm with it, and that and allowing is it, it begins to kind of give you 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 stop distracting yourself. You know, I mean, you might carry on a bit, but then you keep coming back to allowing, and you keep coming back. And it's a process. It takes mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. of, of working on shadow work. Takes time, right? Because you've got to do it yourself. No one can do it for you. No, you know, you've got to do it yourself. It's like meditation. You go inside, you close your eyes, you feel the feeling. You've got to be with that feeling. That feeling is a part of you. You've got to allow it. Yeah. And then that allowing deepens over time. It deepens and it starts to kind of crack open the seed of that suffering. And, that, and then it starts to go through a transformation or a mutation. This is the alchemy. And then that allowing starts to become acceptance. And acceptance is not something you can suddenly do. It has to pass through the phase of allowing. And then the flower starts to emerge and the gift that's hidden in the shadow starts to appear. And first of all, it can be a tiny little flower. It can be a tiny little bit of love that appears or self-love or self-worth or you know, whatever it is, or it can be forgiveness. It's like a tiny seed, start, a life flame starts to kind of come. And then you, your acceptance and your allowing deepens and deepens. And then, the, you know, over time, it starts to become a flower and, you, and your heart comes back to life. And that's what these gifts are. And it's also, there's a great creative energy that comes out of this process. It's, mm -hmm. it's creativity. So we become creative and empowered yeah. and no longer a victim. You know, we, we escape that pattern of, you know, I'm caught by this thing. Mm -hmm. And then the final phase is called the embrace, embracing, mm -hmm. allow, accept, embrace. And embrace mm -hmm. is the city. Embrace is when the shadow has been so deeply accepted that there's no part of you that wants anything to be any different from the way it is. Yes. That's embrace. That's utter embrace. And that's a magical moment. And, and it can't be like, there's no discipline or kind of technique that can get you there. It's sort of, it, you can work and work and work on your, your own stuff for years. And the embrace comes when it comes. You can't rush that. In fact, you have to soften into it in a way. And then I like how you said embrace. that. I yeah. loved how you said that in our podcast with Blue. You said a series of softenings, yeah. um, which I, it really impacted me. And Awakening. I think it is. It is exactly like that. For me, it's been, I, I recently got this award, right? Um, and I had to give this acceptance speech. And, you know, I was asked if I had any regrets or anything like that. And actually, I realized that I wouldn't have changed anything. And maybe if I've given, been given the exact same opportunity to live it all again, even with all the difficulty and all the pain and struggle that I experienced... I don't think I would have changed a single thing. <laughs> I might live that's the exact the, same life over again. That's embrace, right? And that's when the flower, the flower becomes the fruit. And, and that's how we transcend duality <laughs> in answer to your question. You know, the flower like, becomes a fruit. Now, you don't even yeah. realize this, but you're tapping on something really, really deep. Because, and I sent you images of this um, when I got back from Egypt. In the Menkari Pyramid, you know, the original name of the of the Nile River was the Gihon River, which was the same Gihon as described, it means gushing waters, as described in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. And a lot of people don't know this, and it was related, the gushing of water was also relative to the, the Kushite people. So that means that you know, what we think of as Tigris and Euphrates might not actually have been Tigris and Euphrates. It was pre-flood, and so they just named it. It'd be like New York, 
you know, yeah. um, yeah. from people that came from York and, yeah. and, or New Amsterdam. And the idea, and I just found this in a map that sits in the Museum of uh, Galileo, uh, at least one of the copies of it does, that was from 1457. It was a map of the world, the known world before Columbus. And it was interesting because two things I noticed about Egypt and the Giza Plateau was there were five, not three pyramids, yeah, which was fascinating. Map. Why would there be five pyramids, right? That's kind of weird, but really intriguing. The second thing is the Nile was not called Nile. It was called Gihon. And when I was in the Menkari Pyramid, we discovered the exact depiction that is found in the Bible in multiple locations and also in the non-canonical bi uh, biblical books as well, um, where you can find the Garden of Eden as, as being a canopy of trees over a river and the shape of the ceiling in Minkari Pyramid is like a canopy. It's like an arch ceiling. And uh, there were several serpents on the walls and a staff of Hermes or cherubim and a flaming sword over the east wall, uh, right over the Tree of Life. And the Tree of Life is described as having 12 different forms of fruit. And as soon as you just said what you said about the flower basically turning into the fruit, I immediately got that imagery and I feel that that's where we're on the precipice of right now as a collective, that we're about to go into this, you know, we've eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And now we're on the precipice, humanity, of eating of the tree of life. Absolutely. And that's where we... Does that where, resonate for you? Yeah, that absolutely. That's where, you know, on the other side of this transition that we're making, the, which I call the great change, um, is a, a whole other universe opening up to us. You know, so we have learned from the 22, you know, from suffering, and we've learned every nuance of suffering. I mean, we're still learning it. Every single potential nuance of suffering has to be known and allowed and accepted and embraced. And then... That's hard to do, though, isn't it? It's hard. We shift, but we have to, you know, and we have to do it as a collective and we do it in our ancestral DNA. So it means we shouldn't, we shouldn't hate the yeah. suffering anymore. And because that's, an, that's a critical part of understanding the allowance and the acceptance aspects of it. Well, hate may be a, maybe a, a, a part of allowing. Okay. So it's like okay. at the beginning, <laughs> like, yeah, you can hate it, but that's part of the process of allowing you it. Have to, you, know? you have to transcend and yeah. start to see the beneficial aspect of the suffering. Exactly, exactly. And then, you know, some of the great saints, like the greatest saints, like St. Columba, or someone like the, the great Celtic saints, um, you know, there are stories of them asking to be given more suffering, because when, when the depth of that heart opens, you know, there's a direct relationship between bliss and suffering. And actually, that's our next evolution, our next evolution in our future vehicle is the evolution through bliss. And so I relate that you know, bliss is as is equivalent to suffering in a way. It's another universe. Yeah. It has as many nuances in it as suffering does. So our next journey is to explore bliss and all its nuances. And there's a very sweet spot as we change, as we shift between from suffering. I like to the bliss. idea of exploring bliss. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think <laughs> I love I the know. suffering. I, it's I, been I great. Like I wouldn't change anything, but Looking forward, I think exploring bliss sounds pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm with you, Robert. I'm with you. So how what's going this going to be like for us then? How, how do you see us exploring well, bliss? Bring it down to brass tacks. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the, the, the future human, uh, I, you know, I've, I've got a name for it. I call it the Trivian race, Trivian, three ways. And what's happening is we're going to exactly. It's the yin, shen, yang. Yeah, exactly. It's the we shen, the to, X, the 24. We reclaim that series of that in our DNA. You know, we reclaim that third component, that transcendent component that allows us to bend time and space and allows us to travel outside our body with our awareness, you know, and allows us to realize, you know, the, what we really are. 
you know, that we are one consciousness, all these things that you hear, you know, we are one, but we actually need a vehicle that allows us to do that. So it, so a new genetic vehicle needs to come into the world, a new human needs to come into the world to house that kind of consciousness. With the current one, it's like an old model, you know, so we need a, we need a hybrid and then we need the new version to come online. And, and so Gene Keys again predicts um, that those will start appearing and, and I'm sure, did you decade. see, did you see the uh, Schumann Resonance this weekend? What was, the, what about the Schumann Resonance? The Schumann Resonance for the first what time, uh, for the first time ever, has all of a sudden gone to the highest amplitude it's ever had oh, of 190. That. But in addition to that, the waveform of the Schumann Resonance, which usually looks kind of random, you know, yeah. this looks like a wave pattern, but now it's entirely geometric. Uh, it's coherent. It's entirely coherent, entirely geometric, and it looks like this. You see that? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That red circle around it. This is what yeah. it normally looks like up on here, and yeah. that's what it looked like this weekend. Okay. Right. Wow. So and yeah. And it happened on six one eight. 618 golden ratio day which was also father's day uh -huh. and i wrote a poem um a few weeks ago uh -huh. that um i'll read to you Brilliant. and because i've been i've been getting these things come to us through art i think and yeah you know Absolutely. i woke up in the morning i was in miami a few weeks back and i woke up from a dream and i immediately wrote this poem lightning strikes broken thunder earth and child torn asunder a seething bath while calamity boils, infestation to manifestation, lies to and from a nation. Hearts halt when men wage war. A man of old age and blunder, just a sinister wonder of ages no more. New ways of old returning as rushing waters, flooding the undulating valleys of all men's hearts. Mistaken courage and shattered dreams of past paradigm. The ticking clock of stolen moments. A lady of aeons awaits, submerged and so sublime. A world of maladies maladapted, the unsung song, the unkept keeping, a sovereign cure with a sovereign crown when Father Time returns. Beautiful, beautiful poem. I, I love hearing lovely poetry read aloud. So to me, there's something happening. Yeah. And yeah. we're seeing the evidences of it, you know, even that we're having this conversation, I think is, is strong evidence of it. I, I wrote something last week as well, because I, I had a difficult time very recently, just in the last few weeks around a, something, a relationship. And as I was contemplating this, I wrote down the following words. Enlightenment is when the expression of love supersedes the desire for truth. And I felt right. like there comes a point in time in maturity, I think. And when I was young, I, everything was black and white. I yeah. felt like, you know, everyone should be able to easily know what's right and wrong and there should be capital punishment and there should be you know, like rules and strict adherence to those rules. And I, I based my world on facts. And then as time went by, I started realizing that what I thought previously were facts were merely facets of a larger prism of truth. And you could use this, you know, maybe I'm seeing one of these angles on here, but I'm not seeing the whole thing. And in order for me to realize that the entire thing would be some form of objective truth, and maybe there's nothing about it that could be objective. Maybe the whole truth is simply the sum of all possible subjective perspectives. Exactly. And that sum of the truth is actually love itself, because it speaks to the reason why. Why does the one divide itself into the many? to realize its own love. And I, and again, I, I don't think anything is coincidental. So last night I woke up in the middle of the night and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't sleep and I wrote, 
I am that I am. You are that I am. I am that you are. And we are that we love. I truly believe, going back to this comment and question to you about this allowance, the acceptance, right? And then bringing in this whole notion of this divine flower that turns into the fruit. To me, it's about transcending duality, which is a realm of wanting to find facts and truth and be right instead of coming to the right answers. And transcendence of that desire for the truth, which I had a very strong desire for truth, um, and realizing that it's superseded by the expression of my own love for the experience. It was kind of a, a major epiphany for me just in the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah. And I feel a new period happening now in an entrance, it's funny you say this, into bliss. Hmm. Well, I think so, love is the perfect place to end this dialogue today because I think it does come back to, you know, that's what that's that's what Hermes is here for. And really that's what this, this Trismegistus, this, you know, the transcendence. Thrice is, great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the grace of of the Christ impulse, you know, and inside us. And that is love. You know, we have to love ourselves through our suffering out the other side into the realm of bliss, the Buddha realms, the higher realms, you know, the celestial realms. And it is our destiny to get there. I mean, it'd be a shit story if we never made it. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be depressing. We just keep doing this over and over and over again. I mean, you know, even the structure of our stories, right? Story itself. So I'm a lover of story and fable and myth and legend. And, you know, the structure of every single story is the same. All right. Any story that makes us that makes us feel complete anyway. Like, you know, I'm not talking about stories that kind of make us feel, leave us feeling incomplete. But a true story, a story, you know, that it begins with innocence it falls from grace. It goes through a whole journey of trying to reassemble itself. And then it doesn't kind of all come together right until the very end. And then suddenly everything's resolved and happily ever after. That's a, that is the story of consciousness. It's the story. It's, it's the <laughs> it's only the hero's story. journey. It's, 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 it's finding the elixir resonates. and then bringing it back to heal the nations. Yeah. It's written in every single atom of the universe. It's written in every single cell. It's written in every single nucleotide sequence. It's written everywhere. So I I was trying to remind people of that. Like this story ends well. <laughs> it can't <Thankfully>. not. <laughs> yeah, it like can't not. what if what if what if, you know, <laughs> it's funny when I lived in Korea, everything in Korea was like, even though they have a flag that was yin shen yang as well. You know, it was yeah. very yeah. The, the threefold Very and flag. Yeah. 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 They did. Well, they went to a yin yang, but they got with eaching blocks all around it as yeah. well, which is kind of interesting. But, but they, they, at one point during the Koryo dynasty, they actually had a three color flag. So it was red, blue, and, and kind of yellow. And then some of them had four as well, like quaternity. And they look like a swirl, like a, like a, a, a spiral. And, or at least like this, right. Exactly like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The threefold. Right. Exactly. And I, but it's funny though, because in Korea, all the stories are like tragic endings. Right. Right. Even their jokes, they'll have a joke like that. that make, I speak fluent Korean. I can't even understand the joke. Sometimes like there were five birds on an electric wire and someone turned on the light switch and and fried all of them. You know, that's a joke in Korea. (laughs) And like, it's like, how is that even funny? I don't even understand. And when I lived in Tokyo, I used to, I went to like Disney movies and the parts that were like super sad, everyone was laughing at. And the parts that right. were like very, you know, full of, 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 of uh, happiness and joy, people were like sad at, I was like, wait a minute. I don't even understand this. You know, it's like when Mufasa dies in Lion King, like everyone's laughing. I'm like, I, I don't get it. But the, <laughs> the point is that luckily we don't have these tragic Greek style endings in, in this story of the universe. I believe that, I think you're right. I think there's going to be a happy ending here. 
it, you know, it's like Shakespeare, isn't it? You know, you know Shakespeare's comedies. I love Shakespeare's comedies because that you you're like you you end up in this with this story where two people fall in love and then the wrong one falls in love with the other wrong one. Yes, and everything's like in, in a complete chaos. And then there's war breaks out and problems, and everyone's it's so complicated. And you've got to the fifth act. And which you know is the final act, and it's still a mess. And you're thinking, how the hell is this ever going to kind of, you know, you're like you're looking at your watch or whatever, your sundial, and going, he's only got ten minutes to, to kind of bring this all together. How's he going to do it? And yet he does. Suddenly, there's this trigger where everything just goes, and everyone ends up with the right people. Totally. <laughs> and it all happens in the last ten seconds, in the final act. Exactly. And that's, it's going to be like that with us. I think you're right. I feel that too. I totally feel that as well. We are definitely going to do another podcast. I have so many more questions for you. Uh, And I think that I don't, I don't like to cut these things short because I think there's so much wisdom and beauty and this connection. I'm finding so many connections between our work and Shakespeare is another one of those connections. Um, There's such a beautiful story there. And so I, I, at one point I'd love to do a podcast with you and my colleague and friend, Alan Green, who is, yeah, you know, let's talk about Shakespeare. And the great cryptologist the- who cracked the Shakespeare yeah. code. And I have a yeah. feeling we've all worked together before through different time space dimensions. And I think when you guys meet each other, it will be like, uh, you know, like long lost uh, brothers. You'll, you'll definitely recognize each other. So well, let's do a podcast. We will definitely do a podcast on Shakespeare. Have you watched his television show? He has a TV show now on Gaia, Alan does. Uh, I'll make sure I watch. called Shakespeare Decoded. It's very good. You'll like it. Some of them. Yeah, yeah, you'll yeah. definitely yeah, like it. And he and I have done uh, uh, this whole a five part film. Now we've finished the first three parts. The next two parts are about to get released. Called Giza, the Holy Grail of Geometry. I'll send that to you also. And uh, I think it's going to really turn upside down the whole Egyptology world on yeah. dynastic history and. It's pointing to exactly what we've been talking about right here and this coming change and hopefully this new entrance into bliss. And doesn't mean to say that everything is going to be perfect hunky-dory and there's not going to be crazy stuff happening in the world. I think... No, there's going to be... There has to be a transitionary period, a yep. transitionary epoch. There always has to be that where, that, where you have half, you know, half and half and, you know, there's, it's a changeover period. Changing of the guard. Yeah. You know, uh, it was funny. On Shakespeare's birthday, I spent the night in the Great Pyramid in 2022. And I, that night, found uh, three dragons on the wall that were etched into the north wall of the king's chamber, above the bull and the cow that we'd already found, and beneath the, the, the uh, eagle and the Bennu bird, right? And... The three dragons were attached to a tree, which was the tree of, well, two of them were attached to a tree, which was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the Menkari pyramid, which is a separate smallest pyramid on the Giza Plateau, is the Garden of Eden scene, which is tree of life. But the third dragon was above the tree. The third dragon was above the tree. And actually, you will freak out when I show you the photographs of this, that you can literally see the nucleotide pairs connecting the three dragons into a triple strand DNA simplex. Uh, That's a perfect place to end. Like let's explore that. Yes. That'll be in the next one of our next podcast. Absolutely. And the queen of England uh, on, on her Jubilee, they had this thing where she had to press the Royal globe. Right. And, and it lit up this three strand DNA right at Windsor palace. And then it led to a tree of life that lit up. I don't know if you saw that. It was right before she passed away. Yeah. Um, Fascinating stuff. Something, and there's major change. You know, the game is afoot, as Shakespeare would say. Yeah. And I look forward to this next conversation with you and uh, exploring these things with you. Thank you so much for the work you're doing and for bringing this enlightenment of, of greater knowledge changing our perceptions. If you want to change the world, change within. See, Change how you see the world as well. Be the change you'd like to see in the world. And I think that is the beautiful message of, of Gene Keys, and it all culminates in this 
incredible hero's journey that is truly a love story of love stories. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. A real pleasure. And where can people find you? Where can people find you that want to learn more about Gene yeah, Keys, want to learn more about your work? GeneKeys.com and uh, go and explore. It's a big site. This has a lot of different wormholes. Um, one thing, when you get your profile, um, actually, I'm going to tell you something else. Like, I've got a new little app. I don't know if you found my little app. I haven't yet, but I'll, I'll definitely. I have a pro I have a Gene Keys profile. Yeah. The, okay. Well, I've got a little app. It's on the App Store, um, and it's called the Triple Flame. And I, I'm not going to say anything else. Just get it. And the it, Triple and it's Flame. Affordable. Boy, yeah, it's, it's like a, thank you to whoever sent this to me as a gift because it's been really appropriate. <laughs> and and what happens with the Triple Flame is you can set the the app to pause for three minutes every three hours at three, six, nine, twelve. And it's a beautiful thing. And it, it, it also shows you how many others are pausing with you. And on that little app are lots of little intros to Gene Keys and things as well. So I think you you find it fun and, and there's lot there's little meditations you can do, or you can do a silent three minutes, or you can do an om three minutes, or you can you know, with along with me. You know, it's fun. It's it's uh, it's a powerful app. Um, and I think it can help you bring the art of contemplation more powerfully into your everyday life and, and bring that rhythm of the three. Very the deeply. triple flame. So if I go to Apple Store and just type in triple flame, yep. I'll find it. Yeah. And it's, it works for anything. You know, it works for all the Android as well. So triple flame. Triple uh, flame. I'm definitely going to download this. Have fun. And there's lots of things in there. You can go into the into the resources and, and have a little play around and you'll find a lot of my human my design, design, triple flame. I found it. Yeah. Awesome. Triple flame. Yeah. Yep. Thank you Brilliant. so much, Richard. We will do this again for sure. And uh this journey is going to continue as we all enter into the next stage, which will be the bliss phase. <laughs> we can discuss that one as well next time. Absolutely. Have a good Why rest of your day. Enjoy yeah, Devon. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Take care. All right, mate. See you later. All the best. Bye.